Good morning. Good, good morning. Can you hear me? Could everybody please take their seats? Wow, that was effective. That was good. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Jeff Goldberg from The Atlantic Magazine. Uh, and on behalf of The Atlantic and the Aspen Institute, we want to welcome you to this session. Thank you for waking up early. Uh, it's a testament, I think, to uh, Michael Oren's reputation uh, and to the wide interest in this subject. Um, before we begin, I've been instructed to tell you to pay attention to the orange sheet that you've been handed with the scheduling updates. Uh, the purple, thank you, Laura Lauder. Uh, pay attention to Laura Lauder because she knows more than I do about these things. Uh, uh, and, and, and you'll find all of today's uh, scheduling changes on that. Uh, let me briefly introduce uh, Michael Oren to you. Uh, and, and this is a, uh, it's a strange moment for me because I've known Michael for years and we've been friends and uh, yesterday Michael asked, uh, actually he told me that he would pay me if I referred to him as His Excellency. Um, <laughs> but I, I, um, I, I pointed out to, to Michael that we grew up in the same radical egalitarian socialist Zionist youth movement. Uh, uh -huh. I know that sounds like fun, right? Yeah. Um, and and uh, the, 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 the inner Trotskyite refuses to, uh, to uh, in me, refuses to uh, grant you that title. But I'll try to call you Ambassador Orrin. How about Orin. Comrade? Comrade. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to go with Comrade. Right. Um, and that's fine with me. Mm -hmm. um, Michael Oren is, uh, this is a fairly unique appointment that Israel has, has just made. And this, by the way, is... Uh, ambassador Oren's first public appearance as the Israeli ambassador to the United States. Um, yeah. <laughs> and he hasn't even said anything yet. Um, <laughs> and uh, many of you are familiar with his, his work, his best-selling books uh, uh, on the Six-Day War and on the uh, long American engagement in the Middle East. Uh, he, he's a very unusual pick uh, for ambassador for any number of reasons. Uh, the first is that uh, he is a professional historian. He's not a diplomat and he's not a politician. Um, the equivalent, I think, would be uh, appointing, uh, a president of the United States appointing Doris Kearns Goodwin as ambassador to China. Um, and it's, uh, or Walter Isaacson for that matter. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a testament to, to, to something in, in, in the Israeli system that uh, they settled on you. Another interesting fact is that he's not, to the best of my knowledge, a member of the Likud party, which is the ruling party uh, in Israel. Not a uh, member of any party. Not a member of any party. Um, and, and the third, as, you, uh, as I'm sure you all know, is that uh, Michael Oren uh, is not a native of Israel. He's a native of West Orange, New Jersey. Um, <laughs> which is in some ways like Israel. Um, <laughs> and we could go into that. We will. We will. Um, uh, not so much sand. Um, no one uh, ever called me a native of West Orange. A native they of told West me many things of West Orange. A a a a a I think native of West Orange. Um, and he uh, refugee. made a refugee from, a <laughs> refugee from West Orange. Right. Uh, he uh, made Aliyah, uh, moved to Israel as a young man, and recreated himself as an Israeli Jew, this, this move back to Washington is actually kind of unique because it completes a circle in, in a way. Uh, and not only that, uh, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, the, the fascinating thing to me is that as an American Jew, he is in the unique position to explain America to Israelis uh, and explain Israel to Americans. Not only that, as most of you know, there are only two large consequential Jewish communities in the world today. Uh, there's the five and a half or so million Jews in Israel and the five and a half million or so Jews in America. Uh, and, and Michael Oren, um, and I don't know if this is a blessing or a curse, is, is going to be the bridge between those two communities. And, and we want to talk about that. We will have plenty of time for questions and we will get to many of the issues of the day from the settlement issue to Iran. But I thought I wanted, uh, if we could, um, start with your own Zionist story, if you will, just as a way of introducing you. And, and tell us about your decision to remake yourself mm -hmm. as an Israeli. Your, your father was an American Army career officer. 
quite a patriotic family. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you decide to, 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 to attach yourself to this particular Jewish dream? Okay, I'm going to tell you this guardedly because this is soon to be a major motion picture. I can't wait. wait. <laughs> Who's playing Under you? On the contract. Yeah. Um, um, first of all, let me say good morning to everybody. Bokotov. It is not only the, my first appearance as the ambassador of the State of Israel to the United States, it's also my first time in Aspen. I've never been here. Believe it. That should have a sigh. Okay. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's a first time thing. in Aspen. It is the first time that I, as an Israeli, um, get to address an entire group of Americans wearing shorts and T-shirts and ominous suit. <laughs> and it's a nice suit, by the way, especially for an Israeli. How did that happen? This is supposed to be the other way. It's supposed yeah, to be the other yeah, way. Fine. And it's, it is a great honor and pleasure to be interviewed by my dear old friend, um, not that old, um, friend, Jeffrey over here. And I don't even have to be worried about being misquoted by him today because this is being recorded, right? <laughs> um, which is good. I am, my Zionist path, my Zionist trajectory was, was non-trivial, non-conventional because I came from a very normal American Jewish family, conservative uh, synagogue go to, they sent me to Hebrew school, I got kicked out of Hebrew school. I read my, my bar mitzvah uh, on the care and treatment of lepers on, uh, in transliteration. In translation, I couldn't even read the Hebrew in my own bar mitzvah. Um, so much for the American, you know, conservative movement Hebrew system was very problematic. Um, and Went to a regular, didn't go to a Jewish, didn't even have Jewish day schools then. I grew up in an almost entirely Sicilian neighborhood. I was the only Jewish kid in my neighborhood. So there was no big Zionist influence on my life. My parents were sort of mildly Zionist in the way that our neighbors were mildly Catholic. And if one of their kids came home and said, Mom, Dad, uh, I'm going off to join a monastery, they'd, go, they'd probably go a ve or if it's equivalent in Sicilian Italian. Um, but one day I came home quite early uh, when I was eight, nine years old and said, Mom and Dad, I want to live in the state of Israel. No. Uh, and they said, I vape. Um, I don't have an explanation for this. Uh, it, just, it was something I knew from the earliest age that the state of Israel was the most exciting, challenging event in the last 2,000 years of Jewish history. And I was going to be damned if I was going to stay in northern New Jersey and, and watch this from the sidelines and not be involved in it. And so at the first opportunity, um, 15 years old, I more or less lied about my age and got into a group of 17-year-olds going to, to work on a kibbutz. And I went to work on a kibbutz. That was the Hashemir Tzair, radical Marxist kibbutz I was on. Uh, and worked in the alfalfa and worked in the cotton and worked in the uh, cow sheds. And was, it, was, it was the Garden of Eden. I loved it. I loved it. And I would come home every year and mow lawns and shovel snow and clean windows to save up enough money to go back to Israel every year and work for free. How bizarre was that? And it was just such a privilege to be part of Israel was quite pleased with that arrangement, I'm sure. <laughs> I was a lousy alfalfa worker. <laughs> but, um, and, and I just, I knew eventually that I was going to live there and I would serve in the armed forces. What alienated uh, you so much from the American Jewish experience or the American experience that made you want to recreate, re give a rebirth to yourself as an Israeli Jew? Um, Besides growing up in a Sicilian neighborhood and having to run for my life home every day. Um, by the way, the, the, the town I grew up in is the town that they filmed The Sopranos in. My all of my neighbors were named Tony. And they talk like that. <laughs> and at a certain age, you know, the, the kind of tubby Jewish kid next door was a very good target, good practice for what would come later in life. Um, there was nothing, I wasn't disaffected in any way. I loved America. I played, you know, Little League Baseball. I had the ultimate uh, American experience. My wife is from San Francisco. Um, and she grew up, we both grew up in the same era, more or less. Uh, she grew up in the San Francisco of the 60s. She hung out at the Fillmore West. She went to the Happening. She went to the, you know, the Love Fest in San Francisco Park. In northern New Jersey, I grew up in the 50s. Because we grew up basically in happy days with the, the, the basketball games and the soda shops and the pep rallies, and I went to two proms, something my wife would not have been caught dead in, two proms. And um, I had the classical American upbringing. It was just this notion that I had to participate in what I thought, and still think, was the most exciting, challenging, fulfilling, fulfilling experience to occur in the Jewish people in the last two millennia. Do you think that 
the Jews who stayed in America, who didn't follow that path, mm -hmm. are living in exile today? Do you think of this country as a form of exile no. for Jewish people? I think that they... Is that your diplomatic answer? No, or is that it's your... my historian's answer, too. Um, the Zionist movement, as it was conceived certainly in the 19th century, as it was formulated by the founder of Zionism, uh, Theodor Herzl, never came to grip with the realities of American Jewry. American Jewry did not fit the Zionist paradigm. In the Zionist paradigm, Jews cannot become major figures in a government. They can't, be, they can't have uh, more, than a, uh, more than a minion in Congress or in the Senate. That, that would be inconceivable to be a, a, a powerful Jew in a Zionist universe. You have to become an apostate. Can you have, to, you have to be a Disraeli. Can, it, it is the American Jewish experience then a reproach or a, or a, a, a critique in a way of this Zionist idea. I mean, Herzl ignored American Jewry because he couldn't explain, Could explain it. American Jewry. Mm -hmm. So is the fact that American Jews, that Jews in America, uh, have found a kind of promised land in a Christian majority country, does that mean that the Jewish state is somewhat superfluous? No, it just means it, means it, it forms an alternate al utopia for the Jewish people. And just as Zionism never came to grips with American Jewry, American Jewry never clearly came to grips with the Zionist experiment. I'll give you a personal example. In the uh, 1990s, the then president of the state of Israel, Ezra Weitzman, some of you may remember him, the great fighter pilot, uh, decided to hold a conference of the Jewish people at the president's house when he became president of Israel. And he gathered Jewish leaders from around the world and he offered them a deal. He said, let's make a new covenant and the covenant would be based on two concessions. The diasporic Jewish leaders would agree that Aliyah, moving to Israel, constituted a possible solution for Jewish cont cont continuity. The Zionist state, the state of Israel, would have to recognize that life in the diaspora was a legitimate choice for Jews. The two sides sat, debated for three days, and at the end, neither would agree to these concessions. There was no concession. So the, the, the two utopias exist side by side. And over the years, we have developed a more or less uh, confluent and peaceful interaction with one another. Um, and at the end of the day, we find that we really need one another. Um, Israel needs the political and economic support of American Jewry. And American Jewry increasingly needs the spiritual infusion of the Jewish state. I told you I was thrown out of Hebrew school. I read my bar mitzvah in transliteration after sitting in a conservative synagogue Hebrew school for seven or eight years and learned nothing. In recent years, we have found that a 10-day visit to the state of Israel by American Jewish youth does more for Jewish identity uh, than those seven years in Hebrew school. In fact, in seven years of Hebrew school, this one poll shows actually causes a tremendous amount of damage to Jewish identity. <laughs> um, and so I'm looking now, at my 12-year-old daughter right here. <laughs> She's nodding <laughs> furiously. Um, so, but you're supposed to hate Hebrew school. That's part of the American Jewish experience. <laughs> People don't understand that. In order to get us to Hebrew school, my, my parents used to give us a dollar, which in those days could buy a lot of candy. Okay, <laughs> so you would stop off. You'd walk to Hebrew school. You would stop off, and you'd buy the milk duds. You'd buy the, the juju beads, and you know the good and plenty. And then you'd sit there and have ADHD attacks while this guy was trying to <laughs> teach you the Hebrew no alphabet. You couldn't read Hebrew, couldn't right, read Hebrew right. no really. Read Hebrew. Um, that's it. We need but, each other. But let me let me go to what to me is the hardest question. Well, one of the hard questions, and there are numerous hard questions. Uh, Ambassador Oren uh, has written about the existential challenges to Israel extensively, and he's made a, a laundry list of those existential challenges. We'll get to that in a second, but here's the, th the, the thing that I sometimes can't get my mind around. To me, to, to my worldview, and I admit I'm prejudiced because I've chosen to live my life as an American, it seems to me that it's safer to live as a Jew in America than it is to live as a Jew in Israel. Now, the Zionist dream, there were, there were various highfalutin reasons for doing this, but yeah. the basic urge, the basic Zionist urge was to create a place where Jews can live in physical safety. That was one of the basic urges of the Zionist movement. And yet today we see, and I don't think you can deny this, that it is dangerous to be Jewish in the state of Israel, and it is not dangerous to be Jewish in the United States of America. How do you square that? And do you think that Israel has failed in that particular mission to date? 
I think Israel hasn't achieved that goal entirely yet, but let's put it this way. It was one of the goals of Zionism. One of the goals of Zionism was to secure a place where Jews could live out their lives free of threat. But I think the overarching goal of Zionism was to create an environment where Jews could take responsibility for themselves as Jews. And it's the only place in the world where you do take responsibility for yourself as a Jew. You take responsibility for your lampposts and your, your sewage systems and your education systems and your wars and your successes and your failures. We take responsibility for them as Jews. And I think that is the great accomplishment of the Zionist dream was to transform the Jews from passive actors in their history to active agents in their history, to transform Jews from the role of victims, uh, which is a very fundamental transformation from ourselves, to people who take responsibility for all of their action. Look at how many commissions we have after every, all of our wars to examine how well we did in our war and how we failed in those wars if we failed. Um, and I'll throw out just by way of conclusion a little statistic. Israel has the second highest longevity rate in the world after Japan. Guess which is way down on the list? The United States. Israeli Jews live longer <laughs> than American Jews. <laughs> Come to Israel and live long. <laughs> <laughs> That is the most uh, urgent tourist pitch I've ever heard the Israelis make. <laughs> and it really speaks to the Jewish uh, you may have desire. A, you may have a Kassam rocket get very, in the background very back yeah, every yeah. once in a while, yeah. but you'll be watching you them for a long the rockets, time. The right. homeless will keep you alive forever. <laughs> the, um, but go, go to this very basic question that, that, uh, uh, that undergirds a lot of who you are. Yeah. Why is it so important for Jews, to you, for mm. Jews, to continue as a people and as a nation. What is, the, what is that, that urge in you? If what I, is the urge for Jewish no. continuity? You talk about Israel as, yeah. as the ark of Jewish continuity. That in America, uh, th those who aren't alienated from Hebrew school at the outset, many of them drift away from Judaism. America's Jewish population never grows. It always stays constant because so many people leave Judaism. Israel is a Jewish baby machine by comparison. Um, but why is that important to you? Yeah, when yeah, you that, is, that, is, that is almost the most intimate question you could ask me. Almost it go, it, the most intimate almost question. Intimate yeah. question. It goes to the heart of my faith and my, my conflicts with faith. I, I am religiously challenged. I spent m most of my life going through various religious brands of Judaism. I was raised a conservative Jew. At one point, I became a reformed Jew. Now I'm sort of closer to modern orthodoxy in my beliefs, always grappling with the question, what is this Jewish experience about? What is the relationship between the God of Israel and the people of Israel? I have friends, very religious friends, very intelligent people in, in Israel who tell me that the God of Israel cares about the Jewish people, that the God of Israel will never abandon the Jewish people. And my response to them is, well, if he cares, sometimes, sometimes he's got a rather strange way of showing it. Uh, we have a, a Holocaust in our not-so-distant future that we don't have an answer for uh, theologically. We really don't, at least not a compelling one to my mind. And yet, and yet, if I did not think that there was some purpose to Jewish history, that there's a reason why an obscure nomadic tribe 5,000, 4,000 years ago came up with this extraordinary notion of a one God and of a, of a moral universe, the greatest contribution of the Jewish people to humanity is that there's a thing called good and evil out there and, and changed human history irrevocably. And that this people, which has undergone just consecutive expulsions and oppressions and inquisitions has suffered the greatest single mass massacre in human history is still around and still thriving and has come back to be re-enfranchised in a sovereign state that has not enjoyed a nanosecond of peace in its 61 years of existence and which remains a powerhouse by any criteria. To me, there's got to be a reason for that. And there's got to be a reason for the Jewish contributions to science and to literature and to society and to politics. There's some reason to it. What that reason is, I don't know. I still inhabit uh, largely a, universal, a, universe, a universe of doubt. But if I didn't have that sense, I would not have moved from West Orange. I would not have raised my family in this country. I now have had two kids in the army. Both of them are war veterans. As, as you know, one of them was wounded quite severely uh, in a battle with Hamas. My 
sister-in-law was killed in a bus bombing in 1995. I have another son, my youngest kid, my little boy, going into a commando unit this summer. We wouldn't be going through all of this unless we believed. And to not understand that belief is not to understand the resilience and the ingenuity of this state. Let's, let's talk about um, something that uh, the philosopher Avishai Margalit called the immaculate misconception of Zionism. Right. I just, I'm just trying to All right. give you a little jab here. My neighbor. Uh, right. Your neighbor. Everyone's <laughs> uh, our neighbor. And, yeah. and let's talk about, uh, Avishai Margalit refers to the immaculate misconception as follows. He says, he says the immaculate misconception of, of Zionism is that there was no one in the ancient land of Israel, in Palestine, when the Jews decided to go back. That's the misconception, that there was no, there nobody current, nobody living there at the time. And that he sees, and many people see, as the essential tragedy of the Middle East, which is that you have two peoples um, with compelling claims to the same piece of land. Now, talk about, talk about that in, in existential terms, if you will, because I, I, I want to I understand if you actually believe that there is a solution to that original misconception. I also want to hear if, if you actually agree that it was a misconception of early Zionists, that there were no Arabs there, or that the Arabs would acquiesce to the return of large numbers of Jewish people. Well, it was certainly a misconception of some early Zionists, including some non-Jewish early Zionists. The, the, the aphorism, a land for people for a people without a land, was actually coined by a British lord in 1848, a non-Jew. And early, early Jewish Zionists in the latter half of the 19th century believed that Palestine uh, was largely uninhabited. And if you, read travel, uh, if you read travel literature of the period, for example, Mark Twain's uh, piece from 1867, Brinnison's Abroad, everybody remarks, all of these writers remarked how underpopulated Palestine was, and it was. Um, at the turn of the 20th century, there were roughly 800, 900,000 people in all of Palestine, and that is less than the population of Washington, D.C. Okay, it, it was woefully un underpopulated for all sorts of reasons, uh, not the least of them were ecological. Um, but nevertheless, there was another people there, a people which at the time of its, in Zionism's formative stage didn't necessarily think of itself as a people. You don't find the term Palestinian Arab in any of the literature well into the 1950s, never mind the term the 90s. There's a reason why the partition resolution of 1947 calls for creating a Jewish state and an Arab state, not a Palestinian state. The term Palestinian before 1948, ex referred almost exclusively to Jews. The, the Palestine exhibit at the 1939 World's Fair in New York was the Zionist exhibit, not an Arab exhibit. Um, you could have gotten great Palestinian fare there, schnitzel. You got, that was it. Pal a genuine Palestinian meal you could have had there, schnitzel. Um, falafel then was unknown. Um, having said all that, having said all that, at the end of the day, you're absolutely right. The tragedy, not of the Middle East, but certainly the tragedy of Israel and its relationship with the Palestinians is that there is another people. It calls itself the Palestinian people, and we can't define the pal for the Palestinians what they think of themselves, they consider themselves a people, also inhabit the land. That fact does not in any way diminish our right to this land. Understand what I'm about to say. The Jews have an inalienable right an irrevocable right to settle in what they regard as their ancestral biblical homeland and anywhere in it. Anywhere in it, because if you can't settle in Hebron, you can't settle in Tel Aviv, and if you can't settle in Bethel, you can't settle in Haifa. This is the land of Israel. But we recognize that we must resist the urge to realize our right. We have to circumcise our right. Circumscribe our right to accord for the when rights of another. Circumcise yeah. another one, too. Yeah. All right. I can't tell you how many times I make that Paging mistake. Paging Dr. Freud. And I say uh. to myself, <laughs> I say to myself, don't use that word. You <laughs> yeah. always get that word wrong. But it's incredibly appropriate, it nevertheless. Is. It really is. It really works. They do it, too. They do it, too. Everybody. They do it's it too. one of the many things we share with our cousins. <laughs> Pain. pain. Right, um, right. The early infliction <laughs> of unnecessary pain. We recognize that we can't actualize our right fully because of the, it conflicts but, but with the wait, rights of wait, another people. But wait, and so wait. we have to find a way wait. to make our rights accord with their rights. You said we recognize the, the, the we need to. Re but from my humble perspective, Israel has largely failed in the last 42 years to recognize the limitations 
I mean, I'll t quote Avishai Margali, let's go to the opposite end of the right. spectrum and quote Jabotinsky. Jabotinsky's argument for, for, for a Jewish state, he didn't believe that the Arabs would like it. He didn't believe that Arabs would be happy with uh, the scientific improvements the Jews are bringing. But he said that the, that the, the, the Jewish desire for, uh, for the land of Israel at that time in the 1920s and 30s uh, was, an, was a desire born of starvation. And the Arab, appetite, the Arab desire was one of appetite. And, and he said, starvation beats out appetite. The Arabs have plenty of lands. Uh, they don't need this one. The Jews have nothing, so they need this one more. But after the Six-Day War, of which you're one of the world's leading experts, um, a large portion of Israel decided that it needed all of the West Bank, all of biblical Judea and Samaria. Um, that, to, to, in, to my mind, uh, was not a need driven by starvation, but a need driven by appetite. And I'm wondering how you can say that, that Israel has largely resisted the urge to, to inhabit all of the land of Israel when you see the settlements uh, spread across the West Bank uh, and, and see them as one of the main sticking points uh, in Middle East peace negotiations. It seems as if mm -hmm. Israel so far resisted the, uh, the urge for restraint. Now, which one of those questions do you want me to answer? I, was there even a question? <laughs> Did I get my choice? No, 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 no I don't question? even know if there was a question there. Um, no, but whether but, you have a humble opinion? Yeah, I have a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I take issue with the opening remark that the, the Jews had, uh, what was it, the appetite? The Jews had the, the appetite after 67. Right. All right. They, no, they had the appetite well before 67 too, but they didn't have only appetite. They had inspiration. Okay. Jews were coming back to this state, back to their whole ancestral land that they desi that, to which they were connected physically or spiritually over the course of more than 3,000 years out of more than just appetite. It was out of belief. It was inherent to their belief system. It was inherent to the notion of a Jewish people, the connection to the land. And that's why they're coming back. That's why I left New Jersey, not because I needed, you know, I, I was hungry to grab land. I could have grabbed land opposite the country club. Um, I didn't. I came there because this was an essential component of my identity to be on this land. And many, many people followed suit. It was the same thing for you. You didn't need land when you moved to Israel. You did it because it was part of your, your, your identity. So, but, and, and, it's, and it's true that we did not always resist the urge to infringe, to ignore the rights of the other people that also claim this land. That is absolutely true. Though I would you know, keep it in the context that though uh, Jews settlers today account for about 17% of the population on the West Bank, they take up only 1.7% of the land. But beyond that, it is not as if the Jews hadn't tried. Keep in mind, the British in 1938 present their first partition plan. The Zionists debate it. They don't reject it. The Palestinian Arabs reject it and go to war against it. November 1947, the UN creates its first two-state solution. A very small Jewish state alongside a small Arab state. The Jews debate it, they accept it. The Arabs reject it and go to war against it. 1979, the conclusion of the Camp David Accords, negotiated by Jimmy Carter with Egypt and Anwar Sadat and, and uh, Menachem Begin, provided for the creation of a Palestinian state within five years. Israel affirmed those accords. The Palestinians rejected it and basically went to war against it. 2000, another Camp David summit, this time with Bill Clinton, Yasser Arafat, Ehud Barak. According to the American and Israeli versions of those events, Palestinians were offered a state on the West Bank and Gaza, half of Jerusalem, compensation for any land taken up by the settlements. Pa the Israelis probably would have accepted it if it had gone to a plebiscite, and the Palestinians rejected it and went to war against it. So. The, the record shows that while, yes, we haven't always been most sensitive in recognizing and acknowledging the rights of this other people, and I would admit that, it's not as if there haven't been very serious attempts by Jews to try to coexist with these two rights. Do you think if settlements were frozen right now that the Arabs would reach out to Israel for peace talks? Very difficult. Very difficult. So they maybe reach out to peace talks. I don't know where those peace talks would, 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 would run, but I'll tell you, several weeks ago, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, issued, gave a speech. And in his speech, he recognized the need for an independent Palestinian state. 
He wanted the state to be demilitarized because we've had some nasty experiences with Palestinian entities that shoot at us. And he, had, he also had another demand. It wasn't a precondition, but it was a demand that at some stage before the final treaty is signed, that that Palestinian state is going to have to recognize Israel as the Jewish state, as the nation state of the Jewish people. And many people in the Arab world, many people in Europe, were sort of scratching your heads and saying, why do you need this? Isn't this just an obstacle to peace? Um, A.B. Oshua is a, is a very good friend of mine. He called me up on the phone screaming, why is he doing this? It's just another obstacle. He's, your prime minister doesn't want peace. And I explained to A.B. Oshua, I said, I said, bully, I said, what you see as an obstacle, I see as a door. And this is, an idea, this is a notion that I've held for many, many years, well over 15 years, that without recognition of the legitimate existence of a Palestinian people with an historic connection to the land and a right to an independent state in that land, without the reciprocal recognition of a Jewish people with an historic tie to a land and a legitimate claim to a state, there will never be an end to the conflict. That is only on the basis of that reciprocity can we actually end the conflict, because if you don't have that, if you only have the Jewish state recognizing the Palestinian state, you have a Palestinian state that will always regard the Jewish state as illegitimate, foreign, and temporary. And there, to me, that lies the essence. So Israel can freeze settlements tomorrow. We plucked up 21 settlements out of Gaza a couple of years ago, and you know I was there, it was the most traumatic event of my military career was pulling Jews out of their houses. We did that, and in return for it, we got 7,200 rockets fired at us. Settlements are not the issue. The issue is the recognition of the mutual legitimacy of these two peoples, this legitimate claim to this, these two states. There's so many ways to go with this, but let me go with a very specific point. You say settlements are not the issue. The Obama administration believes that settlements are a clear issue. Uh, in, in a way that very few administrations have, uh, they have made this the early centerpiece of their, of their move, their desire mm -hmm. to re reignite peace talks. Do you think that they are making a mistake? I, don't th I, don't th I never said that settlements aren't an issue. And I think, I, I can't speak for the Obama administration, but I think that they understand as well that the settlements are not, not the issue that it's one of many issues. Another issue is the degree to which the Arab states are willing to embark on a process of normalization with us, and that process is, is, is right now moribund. Um, I think that they're both sides, the Israeli side, the American side, are working earnestly, ardently, to try to find a compromise over the question of the degree to which uh, construction can continue in the settlements to accord for what we call normal life. And I think that I'm, I'm fairly confident that in the uh, coming period, we will find a solution for this. Do you believe, you've been studying this for 30 years, do you actually believe that, that there is a moment in time in the near future when the Palestinians will recognize Israel as a legitimate Jewish state? I think there is a, a time in the future, but that, is, that, that moment is the, process, is the culmination of a process. It's a process that begins with the schools. It begins with changing textbooks, which denies Israel's legitimacy and, 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 and right to exist. Two weeks ago, I watched uh, public service announcements by the, by the Palestinian Authority, paid for, by the way, with American taxpayers' dollars. And the public service announcement said, you know, welcome to PA Television. We are going to liberate not only Tulkarm and Janiyam, but we're going to liberate Haifa and Jaffa and Tiberias. Now, that is not the way to go. That does not lead to mutual recognition of two, the right of two peoples to their independent states. And that process has to start now. And we, have, we have recognized our obligations under previous agreements. One of those agreements talks for a sequential process in which Israel will find a solution for the settlement issue, but the Palestinians have to begin to end what we call hatred on their television sets and in their textbooks. Without that, you are raising generations to regard Israel as an alien, hostile, temporal state. And that's, um, that is not a prescription piece. Let me uh, ask one more question, and then we're going we're to open it up to questions from the audience. I'm sure there are a lot of questions here. Um, existential threats to Israel. Mm. Uh, Iran, obviously, is at the top of uh, the prime minister's list, top of most Israelis' list. And, and a lot of Arabs' list. And a lot of Arabs' <laughs> list as well. Uh, go through those existential threats very quickly, if you could, and uh, your view of those existential threats, and uh, talk about the current moment 
in Iran. And the specific question on that is, do you agree with the Obama administration's approach to the current crisis in Iran? Israel has supported the Obama administration's uh, program of outreach and engagement with Iran. Um, we believe that the president has America's best interests at heart. It believes he has the interests of the region at heart. We are concerned. We are concerned about the timing and the timeline of this engagement. There are clocks ticking all around. One of those clocks is the uranium enrichment clock, which will show that it is by a certain date the Iranians will have uh, sufficient uh, highly enriched uranium materials to create a bomb that could literally wipe Israel off the map in a matter of seconds. That they could, they could uh, accomplish uh, in a matter of seconds uh, what they deny Hitler did and kill six million Jews, literally. Uh, we have that clock. We are anxious that Iran also, in the course of its engagement, shows a change of policy in the region. It ceases its, its, uh, its support of terrorist groups like Hezbollah and Hamas that are also trying to wipe Israel off the map. Um, and now we are particularly concerned, in, and not just I think the American administration is concerned as well, in light of recent events in Iran. Everyone's waiting, everyone's seeing what's going to come out of this uh, situation in Iran. But while we're waiting, while we're watching, the clocks are still ticking. Do you believe that President Iran. Obama was strong enough in his support, moral support for the Iranian people? Not do you think there's more that America could do? I'm not going to second guess President Obama's positions on, on Iran. Um, I think his last statement was very clear, very adamant uh, in his condemnation of the uh, regime's suppression of peaceful demonstrators in Tehran and other, other cities. Um, I think it's um, very important, again, that we watch carefully what happens in Iran. On one degree, on one level, the events in Iran have unmasked to the world, to anybody who ever doubted the true nature of this regime. This is a regime that's willing to kill its own citizens. It will certainly have no compunctions about killing other people in the regions, Jews and Sunni Arabs alike. Um, on the other hand, we have to watch and see whether there is a breakdown of rule in Iran, whether a supposedly moderate leadership emerges, which would be welcomed, but if that moderate regime does not moderate Iranian behavior, it would further complicate our situation. Uh, let's go, let's, uh, if you want to line up, there's two mics, I think, one here and one, and one there. Uh, and as you're lining up, just talk for one more second about the other threats that you've outlined in your writing. My other threats? Why, well, just before, before I got nominated for this position, when I could still write as a private citizen, I wrote a, an article called The Seven Existential Threats Facing Israel. Um, and they were threats, some of them are pretty accessible to um, a general reader. Some of them require a certain amount of expertise on the internal Israeli political situation, but they were Iran. They were terror. Terror today posed an existential threat to Israel. It's not merely a nuisance that it was, say, in the 60s and the 70s. We found that terrorists with missiles can uh, literally eliminate normal life in Israel. Suicide bombers can, um, could, could, can uh, impact the economy, can kill our economy. Um, but they were some interesting existential threats, one of which I call the, um, the breakdown, the hemorrhaging of Israeli sovereignty, which was Israel's um, failure to date to extend its sovereign laws uh, over parts of, of its population and parts of its area. Just to give you a more recent example that I can talk about, we have unauthorized settlements on the West Bank. In addition to the, to the, the settlement issue, there's, a, there's an issue of a number of settlements that were not authorized by the Israeli government. Usually young people went up on a hillside and stuck a couple of trailers up there. And this is in violation of Israeli law. We also have a lot of illegal building in Israel. We have illegal building, say, by some Arabs in East Jerusalem. Israel is going to address both of these issues, both the unauthorized settlements and the illegal building within the context of Israeli law. There'll be no more hemorrhaging of Israeli law. And I believe that will address an existential threat to the Jewish state. Um, it wouldn't be the Aspen Ideas Festival if Jim Woolsey weren't at the mic. Again. Jim Woolsey. <laughs> I, Michael, Jim, uh, Woolsey Vantage Point in uh, Hoover Institution. Um, I think there are about a million uh, Israeli uh, Arabs. Yes. And uh, they, uh, about a sixth of the population of Israel. And uh, they, their relationship with Israeli Jews, I'm sure, is not perfect, but uh, they have their own mosques, their schools, they vote for real representatives in a real legislature, they have a Supreme Court justice until recently, I think they had a cabinet member. Um, and they go to sleep at night without worrying that someone is going to kick down the door and kill them. Uh, why would it not be a fair policy 
And I don't think I could persuade the Obama administration to adopt this, but perhaps the Netanyahu administration might consider it. Why would it not be a fair policy that Jewish settlement in the West Bank should be able to continue until there is about the same proportion of Jews living in the West Bank as Arabs living in Israel, and that those Jews ought to be able, along with their Palestinian neighbors, to have their own schools, to have their own synagogues if they want them, to vote for real representatives in a real legislature, to have a cabinet member, to have a Supreme Court justice in the Palestinian state, and to go to sleep at night without worrying that the door is going to be kicked down and they're going to be killed. Once the Palestinians and the surrounding Arab states accept that position, then and only then should the Palestinians get a state. What is your view? My view is that all the issues you raised, Jim, thank you very much for your question. Um, all the issues you raised will be addressed in the final rounds of our talks with the Palestinians, not in the initial rounds. The uh, status of Israeli settlements that may find themselves within the bounds of the Palestinian state, um, certain Israeli Palestinian, it, it, Palestinian Arab uh, populations, that their status, the status of the Arabs of Jerusalem is also a major issue here, uh, will all be addressed in the final status. I think we have, but before that, we can be, we can act according to several guidelines. And that is that nobody, again, should have to be removed from their homes. We did this once. I personally am not going through that again, of throwing people out of their homes. And then that raises the question of the point with which you began your, your remarks, and that is why cannot Israeli Jews, like Israeli Arabs, live in a situation where they don't have to worry about their door being broken down at 2 o'clock in the morning and being threatened at gunpoint you know, for money, being extorted. And that's a problem. Because that means that the Pal if Jews are to continue living in the Palestinian state someday, uh, they have to be guaranteed their safety, their rights, as they understand those rights in the state of Israel. And those rights do not exist in many places in our region, as you know. And that is why we are particularly adamant in, request, in seeking measures as part of the peace process for a bottom-up construction of the Palestinian state. In the past, there's the, 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 the urge, the impulse has always been to build a Palestinian state for the top down. You have a state, give it a stamp, give it a letterhead, and then you worry about building institutions like an independent judiciary, like a reliable police force. And what we found was that when they created this Palestinian superstructure without the institutional foundations, the whole thing imploded. And what you had was the Palestinian Authority in the 1990s stealing hundreds of millions of dollars from their own people. They got nothing. More money, by the way, than given to all of Europe under the Marshall Plan, even accounting for inflation, all disappeared because they didn't have these institutions. Now we're starting to build these institutions. You have a wonderful operation by Lieutenant General uh, Keith Dayton uh, of the U.S. Army that is training a Palestinian policemen. They've taken over four major cities in the West Bank now with, with uh, close to 3,000 American-trained policemen. That's the type of model we have to use. So long before we address the question, of the status of Jews perhaps living in the Palestinian state, Arabs living in the Jewish state, we have to address the question of whether the Palestinian Arab state can provide the state of law and order required. Uh, let's go over here and, and let's try to keep the question short and in the form of a question okay. also. Um, Saint to my in, answers. Uh, no, no. <laughs> one very brief comment and then the question. The brief comment is my wife and I lived in Israel, visit Israel, with some frequency, and I always get rankled with the term Aliyah, which I think is inevitably judgmental about people who Aliyah? choose Aliyah to, to rise like why aren't upward. you living here? Uh, yeah, not no, why, but the term of moving upward. The, the oh. real question, though, it seems to me that only in this last question was the fact that Israel is, in fact, a binational state brought up, that there are a million Arabs and I, in, in Israel. And it does seem to me that when you said that you know, it's the Jews who are responsible for uh, Israel. It's the Jews who have uh, commissions. I frankly would have preferred uh, for you to have said it's the Israelis who happen to be Jews, unless well, one does indeed theologize the state. But why shouldn't we say, well, Christians should have commissions after the Bush administration because after all, this is a Christian country sociologically. I think the question is, why is it a Jewish state? Why is that? I don't know if that was the question. Well, why, instead, of an, instead of an Israeli state. Why do you refer state? to it as a Jewish state rather than the Israeli state because or the state of all of its citizens? The United States 
in, in the world of states, in the world of nations, is very much an exception. Most nations on this earth are nation states. And the Jewish state of Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. Keep in mind, Israel does not have an official religion. Judaism is not the official religion of the Jewish state. It's a Jewish national state, We're the state of the Jewish people. And since 80% of the population of the Jewish state is Jewish, and I think that's a very sizable majority, then we are perfectly comfortable with calling it the Jewish state. And it's a place where Jews, as members of the Jewish people, not necessarily people who keep this particular commandment or another different commandment, because we have plenty of people in Israel who don't keep those commandments, um, can find expression for their national identity as Jews. In the same way that there are nation states with sizable non-national minorities, uh, like Hungary, like some of the Scandinavian states, which are nation states, and by the way, many of them do have state religions, like Great Britain, all right, like Holland, like the Netherlands, uh, and they do have laws of return as well. Ireland has a law of return. Greece has a law of return. Germany has a law of return. There's nothing particularly unusual about the nation state of the Jewish people called the state of Israel. There really isn't. That doesn't mean that we don't preserve, and it is preserved in our Declaration of Independence, the rights of the non-Jewish minorities in our country. And I will tell you right off the bat, honestly, ambassador or no ambassador, we could do better in that field. We've got a long way to go. But we also have the right, as the sovereign state of the Jewish people, to demand the loyalty and receive the loyalty of our non-Jewish uh, minority. And just as a British Jew has no problem saluting and serving and sometimes even dying for a flag that has not just one cross but three crosses on it, there's no reason why a non-Jewish Israeli, and many do serve, cannot serve a flag that has a Jewish star, which is also an Islamic symbol. Now that is not a Christian symbol, but good, we have a lot of Christians serving in the army. No reason. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a Zionist, um, I find myself uh, embarrassed uh, and unable to respond to a foreign minister, the Israeli foreign minister, who is articulating what feels to me like racism. Uh, and that he has this, and that he has this position, that he was appointed to this position, knowing people, the authorities, knowing what his views were. What do I say to my friends who, uh, Bring this up. First of all, his the, the position. The, the, the foreign minister is Avigdor Lieberman, Lieberman. And, and tell him the party and explain the controversy. Go ahead. No, 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 you go. <laughs> Do you the go. job. No, 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 no. I'd also point out that, that, that <laughs> Ambassador Oren uh, was appointed by the Prime Minister and not the Foreign Minister. I think I could take that. Though liberty. I do report to the no, Foreign Minister. You do report to the Foreign Minister. Uh, Avigdor Lieberman is a uh, Russian born politician who is a right winger. Uh, who lives in a settlement, actually, and who has said, uh, and you, you asked me to do it, so I'm going to insert my biases, um, uh, who has said uh, uh, things about the Arab minority in Israel that I find uh, egregious, uh, personally, and who has demanded things of that Arab minority that I don't think are, are within his right to demand. Okay. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you won't call on me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Avigdor Lieberman it represents uh, the third largest party in the state of Israel, 15 seats, very powerful party. Many people in this party would not necessarily call themselves right wing. The party is, is widely misunderstood in this country. It stands for many things. It stands for civil marriage, for example, which is widely associated with the left wing of the Israeli political spectrum. It has, uh, was one of the first parties to come out and accept the uh, roadmap. It's a two-state solution party. It calls for territory, territorial compensation of the Palestinians for any land that Israel would annex in a final settlement. Uh, with the Palestinians. It's also a position that's more, more generally associated with the left than with the right. The most controversial policies, and I think this is what you are alluding to, what Jeffrey has alluded to, are the policies uh, where uh, the foreign minister has called and his party have called on uh, Israeli Arabs to take a loyalty oath. He has since uh, broadened that to call on all Israelis to take a loyalty oath. Now, let me begin by saying all countries in the world, including this country, require loyalty oaths at various times. I took one every single day of my elementary and, and, 
and, uh, and middle and high school every single day. It did me no harm. Um, and when you assume office in this country, you, uh, you, you, you swear to uphold the, the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. You go into the armed forces, you take loyalty oaths. Many, many different things. You want to immigrate to this country, you take a loyalty oath. This party, the Victor Lieberman's party, Israel is our home, Israel Beitenu, won these 15 seats because Israelis are afraid. Because at key moments when we have been engaged in active combat uh, with our neighbors, whether Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, elements within certain communities in Israel have sided with our enemies. Now, I understand that that also represents a minority of those populations, and I think often you know, they're represented by certain people of Knesset who have certain views, or not necessarily the views that are shared by many of their constituents, but Israelis were afraid. And they are looking down the road and looking at the next village and wondering if that village is going to attack them, and they'd like to be reassured of the fact. This is what, where, where, where it stems from. You should know that it's not made up. It's because thousands of rockets are following on our territories, and there are certain people that are celebrating that. And I think if this was happening in your community, you'd be rather concerned about it as well. Now, I want to be very careful about this. All of this, these calls for legislation, for loyalty oaths, for outlawing the, sell, the acknowledging of Israel's uh, creation as a disaster rather than as a holiday, all of them have been turned down by Knesset so far. And this is just one party and several parties. It's not a majority party in the Israeli political spectrum. So see it in context. That's my answer. Uh, let's try to move these questions and answers pretty quickly so we can get to the people. Why don't we start here and then just go right? Okay, I'll be pretty Very quick. Brief, uh, yeah. Will Israel agree to make Jerusalem an international city in the future? Israel's stated position is that, it, is that Jerusalem will remain the undivided capital of the Jewish people. In, that is an issue that we will take up, again, in the final stages of the negotiations with the Palestinians. The Palestinians will table their ideas for Jerusalem, and we will discuss them. Ambassador. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I wish you a successful tour in Washington. Not uh, a Zionist. <laughs> on, <laughs> on my first uh, visit you. to Israel in Everyone's 1995, got up and themselves uh, as a my host there, who yes. was an older gentleman, his name is Emiram Shore, he said, Karim, do you know I'm a Palestinian? I said, yes. how could that be, Emiram? He says, I was born before 1948, and my birth certificate says I'm a Palestinian by birth. Uh, but in any case, uh, the question and many questions come to mind, but one perhaps that hasn't been raised before is uh, if Israel is suggesting that a Palestinian state should be a demilitarized one, uh, would Israel accept United Nations uh, peacekeeping forces uh, on the borders between uh, a Palestinian state and Israel? You can't rule out at any stage, at this stage, any possible outcome of the negotiations. Israel's position has been in the past that it does not look with favor upon the deployment of such forces for several reasons. One is that when you insert what's called a third party mechanism in the area, it relieves the Palestinians of the burdens of their own security and securing their own borders, which we think is an important part of state making. I mean, uh, it took the Israeli project, the Zionist project, took 60 years to build institutions. One of the primary institutions we started with was with our defense, learning to defend our own borders. And so without sounding patronizing toward the Palestinians, I don't want to sound that, but I think it's a very important part in their development as a state that they assume responsibility for their own defense, defending their orders, their own law and order, not you know, pawn it off on some third party mechanism. Also our fear, is that, um, that the international force, a NATO force, a UN force, uh, could serve as a shield for elements that oppose the peace process to shoot behind at us. And then we, we want to get it then, we've got to run up against NATO or the UN, and that becomes very, very complicated. Now, we've had unfortunate incidents like this uh, in Lebanon, as you know. Um, but there have been other areas, such as UNDOF, the United Nations Disengagement Observer Force, along the Syrian border. It's been there since 1974, has done a very good job, and we haven't had run-ins with them. There is an international force on the Sinai border guarding the, uh, observing the U.S., uh, the Israel-Egyptian peace. They work. It doesn't mean that all of these um, UN forces or international forces automatically fail. What is crucial for the success of any international force is the presence of two sovereign, stable states 
that support the role of those UN forces or international forces. And I don't exactly see that happening anytime soon on Israel's border with the future Palestinian state. Can we take two questions and then maybe you could deal with both of them at once? Mr. Gilman. I uh, wanted to ask you a question about a subject that was raised in a brilliant article by Jeffrey last year. Uh, uh, dealing you with can keep going, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> you take as much time as you need. It was the first time I ever read one of your articles, and I've been in love ever since. Uh, I, it Not was in the a, Appalachian Trail sense, yeah. right? All right. <laughs> I just want to make that clear. It, it's always Naked Hiking Day in Aspen. Anyway, uh, um, regarding the relationship between the so-called pro-Israel community here in the United States uh, and what's going on in the state of Israel, uh, Jeff wrote an article over a year ago uh, implying and actually stating that many Jewish leaders or leaders of Jewish organizations and, and virtually all who identify themselves with the pro-Israel community in this country have increasingly taken stands that are well to the right of uh, not only the labor leaders in Israel but actually the Likud leaders in Israel and there is seemingly an increasing disconnect between uh, people in this country uh, who are Jewish and want to support the state uh, in terms of their view as to what mean pro-Israel is and what might be the normative view uh, of an average Israeli. And I'd, I'd, I'd want to get each of your thoughts on that, since I know it's something that Jeffrey's thought about, and in your position, I'm sure you're going to run into it. Uh, that's great. Can we just get the question and then you can feel bad. What? Yeah, he's quoting you. you no, no, it. no, you can do it. But, but <laughs> well, let's get your question just in the, in the hopper. Ambassador Oren, welcome. Baruch haba. We're really excited to have an ambassador who can so articulate what we need to have communicate. I'm Shelley Porges. I'm from Washington, D.C. It seems that one of the major impediments to peace in the Middle East has been the absence of strong leadership, on, arguably on both sides. We now have Benjamin Netanyahu there. We will see how he operates. He's your boss or boss's boss. Um, do we have a reasonable um, and, and strong enough leader on the other side to negotiate with? Because when Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin created their peace, they could enforce their peace. Do we have that kind of leadership on the other side? And if not, who is waiting in the wings on the Palestinian side to take on that mantle? I certainly think that on the Israeli side, we have the requisite leadership in terms of strength. Uh, the current coalition in Israel is a wide coalition. It's a deep coalition. It is broadly representative of the Israeli electorate. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu's last speech uh, on the peace process drew a ring around the Israeli national consensus. It received 77% support. Um, and I think that, that when you go forth into negotiations with 77%, of your population behind you, you have a tremendous amount of, uh, of support. Um, we have people in our government, the defense minister, the, um, the prime minister, uh, who have tremendous have decades of experience behind them, both in diplomacy and politics and defense, a very, I think, um, potent, very robust representation we have. On the Palestinian side, we have problems. We have problems not just in an, in an aging guard uh, in the PA, uh, but the fact that the Palestinian leadership is divided. We have, which Palestinian leadership are we dealing with? Are we dealing with Hamas, which doesn't want to deal with us, it wants to destroy us? Uh, are we dealing with the PA? Now, in the midst of that gloom, there is a twinkle, and that is the, um, the ascent of a young cadre of mostly Western, even American-educated uh, Palestinians, such as the Prime Minister, uh, Salam Fayyad, who may be here soon, yes, um, with whom I think we have a, 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 a genuine um, partnership and under, who understand us very well, we understand them well, and, and they have a commitment to work together with us. It is a beginning. It is a beginning. Uh, a, and it is not the ideal situation where you would have these type of young Western-educated leaders being controlled not of just the West Bank of Gaza as well. Uh, and on that question? Who? The one about how brilliant your article was? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that one. That one. If you want to dilate yeah. on that for a couple of minutes, go right ahead. <laughs> no, the, um, you want me to there's, take this off your... No, no, uh, it, it, this, this, I'm, I'm going to speak now as an historian. There's nothing new about disconnects uh, between American Jewish support of Israel and various Israeli policies. At, at various points in Israel's history, going back to May 1948, where significant segments of the American Jewish community, particularly the organized American Jewish community, the American Jewish Committee, for example, were against the declaration of a Jewish state. 
Um, we have not always been a court. There was a tremendous friction between American Jewry and Israel over the Sinai campaign of 1956. There were disagreements over the way Israel handled, whether the, the, in Israel over the way the, the, some of the elements in the American Jewish community handled the AWACS sale uh, or the loan guarantees issues in 1991. There have been points of friction and disagreements. What holds this whole edifice together, this edifice of having a um, multi-party um, Israeli polity and a pluralistic a plurality of American Jewish ideas, what holds it all together, against all odds, by the way, is the fact that we all believe in the right of a Jewish state to exist and survive. And within the context of that very broad agreement, we can have peace now sitting down with the Zionist Organization of America. There's a messianic image for you. <laughs> within, the, within the confines of the... Uh, I know who the lion is and who the lamb <laughs> is, by the way. Yeah. Uh, within the confines of the President's Conference, uh, when we sit around the table, and I'm often sitting around the table with uh, Jews, both Israelis and American Jews alike, who disagree with many of the positions that I hold, what holds us all together is this common commitment to the existence, survival, and well-being of, of Israel. But I, I think, and I don't want to uh, go on about this, this question, but I, I think something undergirding the question yeah. is this idea that these communities are moving apart, that there's a sense among many American Jews that Israeli Jews are becoming more tribal, if you will, and that there's a sense among certain Israelis, and certainly there's a sense in the American Jewish community itself, that we're becoming more universal in a kind of way, and that you see there are diminishing numbers of, uh, of, uh, of American Jews, young American Jews, who are embracing the cause of Israel as their primary, even secondary, cause in their life. Um, and part of this is that, is that disconnect between the American Jewish leadership and some of the, 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 the younger cadres, if you would borrow your word, um, and, and, and what, you're, what you're seeing is uh, that, that some from, I think, my perspective, some unfortunate Israeli policies being strengthened um, by an American Jewish leadership that might not even represent the majority of American Jews on some of these questions related to Palestinians especially. Okay, fair enough. But you don't have to. No, but I, I, I'm just briefly, because it, the question could easily require an hour response, which I know you want to sit through this morning. Uh, it's a beautiful day. Um, there are many reasons why this is happening. It's not just because Israeli policies are, are creating a disaffectation among, among young American Jews. It's the way Israel is portrayed in the press. It's the fact you have a generation now, unlike our generation, that does not remember events like the Six-Day War or Entebbe or the creation of the State of Israel, which is moving further and further away from the Holocaust. Um, uh, many issues. Uh, there's a general movement away from Judaism itself, not just from the state of Israel, from Jewish practice, higher rates of intermarriage in this country. It's not just because Israel has a certain policy about not freezing settlements for, for, to account for, uh, for normal life. Uh, it's not just about that. Uh, but, but the good news is that through organizations like Birthright, and I have to plug this because my wife worked for Birthright, um, which has now sent 140,000 Jews, young Jews, to Israel on a free 10-day trip, uh, the levels of support for Israel, for interest in becoming members of, active members of Jewish communities, synagogue membership, marrying Jews, studying Judaism, has shot up through the roof from a 10-day visit to the state of Israel. So what does this say about Israel's role in uh, revitalizing and sustaining an American Jewish youth. Let's take the last three questions just very quickly, and then, uh, then I just want to say something in closing. So why don't we go one, two, three. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Sure. Faraz Maksad, I'm originally from Lebanon. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I couldn't help while listening to your very compelling story of a, of a young Jewish kid being brought up in New Jersey and the personal pull you felt towards Israel, but think of a lot of Palestinian friends, refugees that I, uh, friends of mine that are in Lebanon, who also have uh, very equally compelling personal stories that tie them back into their land in modern day Israel. Um, my question to you is, from a historical perspective and from a moral perspective, how is it that Israel and Zionism can sanction and advocate the return of the Jewish people after thousands of years in exile, and at the same time deny Palestinian refugees that have only been out of their lands for a generation or two from their right of return? And you'll do that in 25 words. Um, why don't we just take the thank you very much. Let's take the last two questions over here. Uh, hello, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, I'm here with my fellow uh, Bezos scholars, and we're 17 uh, years old. Uh, we're all here gathered. Welcome. And we are very uh, you know, interested 
in uh, getting inspiration. And particularly, uh, since we're so lucky to be at this Ideas Festival, this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, we'd like to seek uh, some inspiration on creativity and innovation. And we'd like to particularly see it uh, from you, a notable, and how you are applying it in this process. This is a very unique situation, uh, you know, the Israeli and Palestine situation. So if you could maybe just walk through some of the processes of making sure that it's not just a two-state solution, but you've examined everything. Because just like the people who have come before you, you know, they've examined other things. But what particularly have you done in that realm of creativity and innovation that you can share with us? Thank mm. you. And why don't you take the last question there, and then we'll... Hi, uh, Mickey Bergman, actually born and raised in Israel, served in the military for six years, came to the United States uh, about eight years ago, and actually took the Pledge of Allegiance uh, uh, last October uh, in time to to vote. One very important comment, because you talked about the loyalty oath. Um, I chose to take the Pledge of Allegiance in the United States. That point of choice is extremely important and make irrelevant, I think, your argument about comparing it uh, to the loyalty oath suggested by Lieberman in Israel, because the Israeli Arabs did not choose to be citizens of the State of Israel. It was forced on them because of where they lived. And as long as there's no Palestinian state next door, you're basically telling them, pledge allegiance, by the way, written law, the, the proposed law is pledge allegiance to the state as a Jewish democratic state to its, uh, to its flag and to, it na to its national anthem, which is a very Jewish uh, uh, anti. I want to, to make that a point. It's extremely important. I want to strengthen the hand of, uh, of, the, uh, of the lady that talked about it before, because even though it did not pass yet, it is in a ministerial committee review, even if it passes, Supreme Court will probably uh, strike it down, but still, he is the Let's foreign minister. Let's let the ambassador answer that. Thank you, Thank you, thank very, you for the question. Very quickly, yes. very quickly yes. uh, try to wrap up these Okay, three. Rab, let's talk about the Palestinian refugee issue, issue because it's a, it's a core issue. And there's no question in my mind that the Palestinians suffered. And they suffered an injustice going back to 1947, 1948, and I think much of the injustice, in fact, was self-inflicted by their own leadership. They were very, very poorly led, and they've been very poorly led in many ways since then. And I'm committed, not just as an ambassador, as a citizen of the state of Israel, I am committed to trying to rectify whatever wrongs were done to the Palestinians to the degree that are consonant to my interest of not committing an injustice to the Jewish people. And our justice demands that we have a sovereign state in our homeland. Now we've created a situation, I think now, where there can be a Palestinian Arab homeland. And the Palestinians' fulfillment of their national right, which is a legitimate right, I stress, can be fulfilled in that national homeland as the Jewish national right is going to be fulfilled in the Jewish homeland. And, uh, and that is the best we can do. Justice is not an absolute. Justice often requires compromise on both sides. I think that you're from Lebanon, and I think that uh, the Arab world, how you said this, has a very important role to play in this. There, there are Palestine, the da Palestinian diaspora, you know, in Syria, Jordan, in, in the Gulf. The place where the Palestinian refugees, in many cases, have the, few, have the least rights are in Lebanon. And they often cannot travel out of their camps. They can't be in certain professions. I think that Lebanon would have much to contribute to solving or at least alleviating Palestinian suffering by removing some of the restrictions on their Palestinian refugees. You want to deal with the last two very quickly? Last two. Let me, let, me delete, let me deal with the last one first and then the, well, and then the panels of it. Ways, yeah. um, as for the loyalty oath, again, this is a, a position held by one Israeli party. It, if it even manages to pass Knesset, it has to come up against the Supreme Court, which uh, traditionally rules very much against such uh, actions. And then I think that any real comparison between the American situation and the Israeli compar comparison a situation at some level uh, fails the test of reality. The fact of the matter is the United States is not surrounded by many countries uh, that, with which it has been at war for the last over six decades. The United States is not facing uh, terrorist groups that want to wipe, off, wipe its off its map who are literally on its border and armed with tens of thousands of missiles. The United States is not facing a, not exactly neighbor, but almost a neighbor that declares almost daily its desire to wipe that state off the map and is and assiduously building a nuclear program to do that. Israel is in a sui generis situation. 
And that is not to you know, excuse the demand for loyalty oaths. It is to put it into a context. Israelis, for some reason, are afraid. And that fear may just have to do with the incidence of hundreds of suicide bombers, thousands of rockets and mortar shells, and the existence of these countries and organizations that want to kill us. Um, the last question on the, from the Bezos Scholar. I'm always looking for creative <laughs> solutions. Um, uh, when I first, um, I think that's the question, my thinking about creative solutions. Yeah, I can actually tell a story about you uh -oh. uh, on the creative, well, I, this is, uh, <laughs> and this is by way of closing, and maybe right. uh, I'm sure that uh, Ambassador Oren will spend some time with uh, some of the young scholars today. Uh, uh, just by way of closing, I know we have to wrap it up. Um, the, uh, and, and I'm telling this because it's your first public appearance as the uh, Israeli ambassador, and, and we've been friends for, for years, and uh, I think it's important to, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, who you are and, and what I understand um, as Michael Oren's baseline pragmatism. And I'll tell you a very quick story and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. In 2006, in the Lebanon War, I was over as a reporter. Michael was in the Army uh, as a reservist, uh, as, a, uh, as a spokesman in the spokesman's office, and we hooked up on the Lebanon border. Uh, and we're driving around just trying not to get kidnapped, actually. Um, and uh, at, at one point, he was assigned to um, babysit the Today Show, um, who had sent Ann Curry and a crew over to, to, uh, to, to, to cover this war. And um, Ann Curry wanted to uh, go see an artillery battery in operation. Um, so Michael trying to please the Today Show. Uh, we're driving around looking for an artillery battery, which isn't hard to find because they're very loud. Um, and uh, and, and we're, we're, we're dri we drive up to this checkpoint, uh, the NBC people in the, in the car behind us, and a young Israeli lieutenant is there, and he blocks us, and he, uh, he, he says, what are you doing? And uh, Ambassador Oren says, uh, oh, we have this a TV crew. They want to see this artillery battery. And the Israeli lieutenant looks at him and says, are they anti-Semites? And, and Michael, says, joking. Michael says, Michael says, no, they're from NBC. Um, <laughs> now that of course the, has nothing the, to do with the last and, question. And, 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 no, 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 no. You just had to get the story. I just need to get the story. And, 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 no, no, there's a point. There's a point. Believe me. There's a point. And, and the lieutenant says, okay, you can go through then. Um, <laughs> and we're driving down this dirt road, and I look at him, and I say, what was that? And he said, and he said, look, when something works in the Middle East, don't ask why. Just move Dude. to the next problem. <laughs> and I think that's, that's the theme of his ambassadorship. And we thank you very much for coming today. Thank we you. appreciate it. No, 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 it was great. Thank you. Thank you for coming.